God, you're so good. Amen to that. Thank you for that wonderful time of worship and praise. We welcome you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Would you be finding 1 Corinthians chapter 13? If you don't have a Bible or a phone that has the Bible on it, there's a Bible in the pew right there in front of you. So be finding 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now we're in a um, series entitled, There's No Place Like Home. And we've been looking at the home, we've been looking at our marriage and the foundation for that, and, and so we're going to continue with that uh, today. Let me just kind of quickly share with you where we've been. Week one, we talked about the purpose of marriage. Uh, week two, the plans for marriage. Uh, week three, the power of marriage. Now, I used an, an analogy, we're talking about there's no place like home, and, and so how do we build this home and put it within a house. And so we've been talking about a house and house plans, and it's just an analogy. It's an illustration. You've, uh, a lot of times we, we use illustrations or analogies to drive home a point and so forth. And someone said the other, I read the other day, I thought this isn't talking about marriage and the analogy. They said, marriage is like a deck of cards, playing cards. They said, in the beginning, you have two hearts and a diamond. At the end, you have a club and a spade. <laughs> so I don't know. I was thinking about how many times Marcy wished she had a club, probably several times. I'm not sure. But it's just an analogy. So we've been, we've been talking about a house and that building process. I, I shared with you the illustration about going down to Lowe's and, and the house plan book. And you, you open that up, you're wanting to build a house, and you see a picture of the house. And the model house or what the model you want. And then over on the next page, there's floor plans. And you send off for blueprints that if you follow those plans and follow those prints, then you'll have this home that's pictured on the other page. And so that's what we talked about. Week one, we talked about that model marriage and how the reason God brought us together for companionship and so forth. And then week two, we talked about the plans or the blueprint uh, of how to do it from... Uh, uh, 1 Peter 3 and Ephesians 5, we talked about laying bricks. The husband has bricks. The wife has bricks. We don't throw the bricks. We lay the bricks and build a, a marriage. Now, what we want to talk about this week is the, the mortar for those bricks or the power of marriage. Now, think about it this way. If you lay bricks, you're building a house, and you just dry lay the bricks, unless I could come over and push those over pretty easily, as a matter of fact. But what do we do? No, we, we put Oh, we've got a foundation, we've got a footer poured and a foundation. We lay those bricks and then we, we put mortar in there to keep that thing solid. So my question is, what's the mortar for our marriage? Well, it's love. You know, when you put a roof on, you, you, you put that decking down, you don't just lay it up there and kind of it blow right off, fall right off. No, we nail it, we secure it. So we're talking about today the, the, the mortar, the, the nails, what holds a marriage together, what keeps it strong, and, and that is love. And that's what we want to think about today. You know, when you, when you uh, ask people about love, we, we throw the word around pretty loosely, right? I mean, we love the Razorbacks, maybe not so much right now, but typically we love the Razorbacks when they're not getting blown out and so forth. And, and hey, we love that white cheese dip down there at Las Palmos, don't we? I mean, that stuff's good stuff. I mean, we love that stuff. Uh, but we, we throw that word around, but I don't know if that's really... That's certainly not a, a biblical way to use the word love. I was thinking, I was reading, I always enjoyed, lit if you want to know the truth about something, just ask children. And some children were asked, what is love? And so I just want to share a few of these. with These are young children. These, they're five, six, seven years old, uh, eight years old. And they were asked, what is love? Sandy, age eight, said, love is uh, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over to paint her toenails anymore. And so my granddad does it for her, even though he's got arthritis too. That's love. And I thought, man, that's a pretty good definition. Erica, seven years old. Love is when you tell a boy that you like his shirt, and then he wears it every day. Amy, age eight years old, says love is when you kiss all the time. And then after you're tired of kissing, you still want to be with each other and just talk. My daddy and my mommy are like that. Only when they kiss, they look gross. <laughs> Andy, seven years old. Love is, I love this one. What, love is what is in the room on Christmas. If you stop opening your presents and just listen. That's pretty good. Dennis, uh, seven years old, said love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on uh, aftershave and they go out together and smell each other. That's pretty good. <laughs> 
Jenny, eight years old, said, when I had a piano recital, I was on the stage and I was so scared. I looked out at all those people looking at me. And then I saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that, and I wasn't afraid anymore. That's love. I like that. So that's, that's the way of a dad. So love, what is it? Well, the Bible mentions three kinds of love. Really, it mentions four or five kinds of love, but three primary uses of the word love in the Scriptures. Uh, and let me just, by way of it, I've given these to you many, many times, but I think as a foundation, it's important to understand it. First of all, phileo love. What's phileo love? Well, it is what I might call a recreational love. It's a, it's a friendly love, a brotherly love. That's what we call Philadelphia. It's that Greek word phileo. It's, it's where we get the city of brotherly love. It's just, it's, it's a typical normal, normal love for a guy to have for another guy. He likes to hunt together, golf together. It's ter- perfectly normal. Uh, you know, you can have it for each other. It's just a, a recreational kind of a love. Uh, eros love is where we get our word erotic. It's a romantic love. It's a sexual love, yes. It's a romantic love. And, and neither one of these, recreational love or romantic love, is a foundation for marriage. It's just not. I mean, if you build your marriage on either one of those, listen, you're just destined to fail. When the storms come, they will come. Man, it's just going to crumble. It's going to fail if you build it on these kind of loves, this kind of love. Number three is the word agape, agape love. And that's a righteous love, a godly love, the kind of love that the Scripture uses as it describes God's love for us. As a matter of fact, nine times in 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to see the word agape uh, that, that's the kind of love that's described here, okay? So, 1 Corinthians 13, let's read, read our passage. You can't really have a sermon series on marriage without uh, looking at love because it is the mortar that holds our marriage together. So, 1 Corinthians 13, and let's start in verse 4. Love, agape, love, is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love Agape love never fails. So let's stop right there. The word agape is, is, is really, it's not really used outside of Scripture because it is, it's a biblical love. It's a godly love. It's the, kind of, it's the kind of love that seeks to give rather than get. You know, we've, we're going to talk about selfishness. We talked about it last week. We'll talk about it some more today. But agape love doesn't seek to get. It seeks to give. It, it, it wants to give. Uh, that's the kind of love God has for us. Think about John 3, 16. What does it say? God so loved agape, God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave. Gave us the greatest gift we could ever receive. Uh, and while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. That he demonstrated his agape love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so agape love gives. And hey, verse 8 says, agape love never fails. And so with that in mind, well, I can give you a timeless truth. See if you would agree with this. Real love, agape love, righteous love stays in love. And if someone says, hey, I just don't love you anymore, then we must conclude that they never had agape love. Because God says agape love never fails. Amen? I mean, we, just have, to, we have to come to that conclusion, okay? So, with that in mind, thinking about love, I want to look at only two things today. Man, these two-point, Jerry, these two-point messages, you're going to be the first in line at the restaurant again this week. I just, I just can't get it. We've got to stop doing that, all right? We've got to get back to the four, five, ten-point messages. Amen? Amen? No. I got people out there going, no, no. Okay, two points. That's all there are. Uh, number one, avoiding negatives that damage our love. Now, we only have two points, but as you can see on your outline, I've got two acrostics, the word damage and the word treasure that I want to use. And here's, here's what I want to do. This is your homework assignment. We're not having growth groups tonight, by the way. I want you to come tonight. We're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. And so we want every, all the growth groups to come, everybody to come, all of you to come 
and let's commemorate, let's think about and do the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the Lord and what he's done for us. So we're going to do that tonight. So no, you won't be talking about it in your growth groups, but here's your homework assignment. I want you to fill out the bulletin. I want you to fill out all these words we're going to mention. I don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to mention the word, verse of scripture, maybe a quick principle. And what I want you to do is take this this week, take your bulletin, sit down with your spouse, maybe take two or three nights to do it, and just go over this this message. And I want you to go over these these principles we're going to be sharing. And then I want you to grade yourself, and I'd like you to grade your spouse, okay? So I don't know, A, B, C, D, F. I don't know if they still use that scale at the school anymore. I like the 1 to 10 scale, 1 being pitiful and 10 being perfect. Just see, where, where where are you, 1 to 10? And so as we list these things... Here's, I, I see myself as being a seven on this particular thing, and I see my spouse as being an eight or whatever. And then I want you to talk about those things, okay? So the first thing we're going to think about is negative things that damage agape love, all right? So let's look at them. Starting, we're using the word damage, and uh, I want to start with the word dishonesty, okay? Look at verse six. And what I want to do, you can jot the references down. And because all of these are going to come straight from this passage of Scripture, okay? First thing that will damage my love is dishonesty. Look, if you will, in verse 6. It says, agape love rejoices in the truth. The truth. I asked Marcy this week, I said, what do you like best about me? Is it my firm, fit, fabulous body or is it my intellect? And she said, it's your sense of humor. (laughs) So, uh, listen, honesty, sometimes we may not like it, but it's so needed in a marriage. And and he says here, agape love rejoices in the truth. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that there are seven things the Lord hates, seven things that are an abomination, and one of them is dishonesty. Now, I think we understand that it's, it's, it's not good to be dishonest about hide things from our our spouse, hide things. Maybe it's about places we go or people we're, we're in, in talking with and engaged with and problems we're having. And so we just kind of, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to hide the truth a little bit. I'm going to skirt the truth a little bit. I'm not even going to share that. What they don't know won't hurt them, that kind of thing. And so we, I think we all know those things are not good. They're not healthy for a marriage at all. But then what about, and, and so we, I think we know those things and you can talk about those things, but what about times when I think we're dishonest when, let's just say your spouse is acting a little different than they would normally. Um, You know, maybe they're slamming drawers or they're throwing some things down or maybe they're huffing and they're puffing a little bit. And then you go over and you ask them, what's wrong? And then that, here it comes. Come on, a lot of you are laughing and smiling right now because you know because you're guilty as I am. What's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing's wrong. And listen, you can tell by the way they say nothing that something's wrong. Amen? And so what are we doing? Well, really, that's just another form of lying. Because when we say what's wrong and something really is wrong, and we, know, we both know something's wrong, but then we say nothing's wrong, we're lying. And so what, what's, what happens? You think, well, that's pretty innocent. But over time, what happens is bitterness builds up. Because if you don't ever get to the root of really the things that are, quote, wrong in a marriage and are not going well, listen, you're going to have bitterness build up and it's going to be a big thing and a lot of times leads to a blow up and so on and so forth. So honesty is very important. Think about it this way. Normally, honesty doesn't drive a spouse away, but dishonesty does. Because dishonesty says loud and clear to your mate, I don't trust you you. And so we we have to be honest. I think that's very, very important. So again, we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time on these. You can jot them down and talk about these and your time together this week. D is dishonesty. A is anger. Look in verse four. He says, love is patient. So agape love is patient. Look in verse five. It is not easily provoked. Agape love is not easily provoked. You know, some people, it's like living with a ticking time bomb. You just, you just, it's so easy, I mean, you just, you're walking on eggshells around them, you don't know how they're going to respond, you don't know how they're going to react to something you say or something that happens or something the kids do, and, and man, I'm telling you, I would, I would hate to be in a home like that, and yet some of you are, because your spouse is a ticking time bomb, maybe you're the ticking time bomb, and so it just doesn't take much. Well, the Bible says agape love is not easily provoked, it doesn't take... 
Agape love doesn't have a short fuse. Man, it has a long fuse. That's what it's saying. Love is patient. Proverbs 15, verse 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger pacifies contention. Proverbs 29, do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Listen, if you have a short fuse, what do you do? Man, you need to, number one, admit it to God, admit it to your spouse, admit it this week as you sit down and talk about it. But then not only admit it, but you need to immerse yourself in the scriptures, especially the book of Proverbs. There's so many passages that talk about anger and, and, and the, the problem that it brings. And so what, what you need to do is immerse yourself so you can take those principles from Scripture off the pages of Scripture, get them in your mind that you might get them down in your heart and change the way you live. And God will help you to do that. So if you want to damage your love, anger will damage the love. M, that was pretty simple. It's me. And I'm talking about selfishness. Look in verse 5. It says, agape love does not seek its own. It doesn't look out for itself. Agape love is, what we say? It's giving, not getting. And we've talked about selfishness a little bit last week. And I think that's the principle for this week. If you want to damage love in a marriage, be selfish. Always think about yourself and what you're going to get. And, and, and let, let, the, let the marriage revolve around you. And you're going to bring great damage. Philippians 2 verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another. And that would mean your mate. Regard your mate as more important than yourself. And so we need to be selfless in a marriage. Richard Fitzgibbons, Institute of Marital Healing, put it this way, talking about selfishness. He said, selfishness is one of the major enemies of marriage, married love. Selfishness interferes with healthy self-giving, which is the essence of marital love. Subsequently, this personality weakness creates significant pain and suffering in marriages and families. It is the major cause of marital anger, permissive parenting, addictive behaviors, infidelity, separation, and divorce. Unless it's uncovered and addressed, selfishness will lead spouses to treat ones as objects and not as gifted persons. It is one of the major reasons for marital strife, selfishness, and we have to slay that. Agape love says, I'm not going to seek my own. I'm going to seek the good of my mate as more important than myself. The letter A, abrasive, abrasive. Um, look in verse 4. It says, love is kind, okay? Verse 5 it, is, it doesn't act unbecomingly, okay? So both of those words speak to abrasiveness. You know, we all know what an abrasive is, right? It's, it's uh, sandpaper is an abrasive. And, and the surface that you're sanding or, or what you're using to sand has to be harder than the surface that you're using it on. That's why the grit on sandpaper is harder, made of harder material than the soft wood that you're sanding. And so that way it cuts the wood and it sands it to a nice smooth thing. But you would never use an abrasive on your hand to do that. But yet we use abrasives on each other with our words and with our deeds. And that's, that's what he says. It doesn't act unbecomingly. You know, to me, it's like a selfish jerk. You ever been around a jerk? They act unbecomingly. Uh, I think I don't have to, I just don't think I really have to explain it that much. I think you understand what being abrasive is, is all about. Um, I read about a lady and a, um, a, her husband. They had just had the empty nest. You know, for the first time, their last, they got their last kid off to college. And, man, they came back, and they're sitting in the house, and they're all by themselves. And he went over, and he laid down on, on the couch, and he laid his head in her lap. And uh, she just took his glasses off, and she said, Honey, without your glasses, you look like that same handsome man I married. And he looked back at her and he said, without my glasses, you look pretty good too. <laughs> you know? So but it's just cutting, it's cutting remarks that, listen, can be abrasive at times. And I think, again, we all know what that is. The letter G, grudges. Look in verse five. Agape love does not take into an account a wrong suffered. That is, agape love doesn't hold grudges. Do you hold grudges? I mean, who, who wants to live with a person who's always bringing up your failures over and over and over again, and yet they say, I forgive you, and I've forgotten about it until the next argument, and here it comes again. Well, agape love doesn't hold grudges. Agape love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. 
uh, agape love biblically forgives. Here's what the Bible says, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And so that's the way we're to forgive our mate, the way God, forgive everybody, but certainly our mate, the way God has forgiven us. Now, I want to ask you, this is a silly question, but I hope it will drive home the point I'm wanting to make. How many of you want Jesus to bring up at judgment day the sins that he's said he's forgiven? Well, none of us want that. He, he said, I've forgiven you. And, and those things are gone. They're forgiven and they're forgotten. As a matter of fact, listen to this verse of Scripture, Psalm, Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed our sin from us. Listen, if you go north, at some point you're going to start going south. But listen, when you go east, you'll always be going east. East and west never meet. And so he's saying, listen, that's how far I've separated your sin from you. I've removed it from you. Well, none of us want him to bring that back up on judgment day. And so he says... The way I've forgiven you is the way we need to forgive each other. As much as we'd like to, and the old devil saying, yeah, and remember this, and remember this, and men tell them this, and so on. Listen, we, we, need, to, we need to reject that and, and truly forgive the way the Lord wants us to forgive. C.S. Lewis said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something or someone to forgive. It's easy to talk about it, but listen, when it comes down to it, it's more difficult. And so Agape love holds no grudges. The letter E, excuses. Look in verse 7. If you want to damage your love, just make excuses. Look in verse 7. It says, love bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. See, agape love doesn't make excuses. And so a lot of times, especially as it relates to fulfilling our role, sometimes we don't, we know our role. We read the Ephesians passage, the Peter passage. Uh, we, we read these things and yet we know what we're supposed to do. And yet we just make excuses. Husbands, how many husbands in this room are making excuses about their poor godly leadership? The way we talked about last week, whether you're to lead your wife and to love your wife, and why aren't we doing that? Well, I don't know, I've got this and my work and the kids and the money and all. And so we make excuses. Agape love doesn't make excuses. Ladies make excuses about why they won't follow, why they won't lead, why they won't let their husband do what he's supposed to do, and that is to lead in the marriage. And so we make excuses as to uh, why we do what we do. And it's just that, excuses. James 4, 17, to him who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, that is, makes excuses, to him, it is sin. And so, right from, right from the, uh, the Scripture, 1 Corinthians, we see a lot of things that damage agape love. So, I want you to sit down this week and talk about each one of those things. Number two, not only avoiding the negative things that damage my love, but advancing the positive things that treasure my love, okay? And so I want to do the same thing with the word treasure. And let's talk about some positive things that should be included in our marriages, okay? The letter T, talk. And and beside that would be the word communication. You have to communicate. Um, I want to give you a passage of Scripture that... um, well, I'm going to give you two verses. I'm going to read them one at a time. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, think about that. Stop right there. He says, with our words, you can bring death or life. That's how powerful our words are. That is, you can, you can kill somebody with your words. You, can, you, can, uh, you just strike at them, abuse them, and tear them down with your words. Or you can build them up. And you can, you can give life, and I'm talking about specifically to our mate now. You can tear her down, tear him down, or you can build him up. There's that much power in the words that we say. Now look at the very next verse. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. As I've read through the Proverbs, have you ever read through the Proverbs? And it seems like they kind of go all over the place. I mean, the subject's here, and then it changes subjects there and so forth. And there might be three or four sometimes verses together, but for the most part, they just, they're just kind of they're Proverbs. They're just sayings, wise sayings. Well, I don't know that it's a mistake that I don't think it's a happenstance that these two verses go together. He's sitting here talking about the pursuit of a wife and then the power of our tongue. And it's the power of our words. And so he's talking about how important our communication is. Um, I'm amazed when I do marital counseling how, how many couples absolutely don't communicate. They, I just think you're supposed to know what's going on. You're supposed to know what I'm thinking. And my goodness, 
I, I don't know how that's supposed to work. There's supposed to be communication. That is the po- a positive thing that we must have if we're going to treasure our love. Debbie, Dr. Derry, uh, Debbie Cherry put it this way. One reason we tend to communicate better and more often during the dating stage of a relationship is because it is then that we're focused on building intimacy and closeness. Once we feel the relationship is established, we tend to stop focusing on building it and too often believe it to be a finished project in need of little or no attention in the future. And, and how wrong, I think that's so true, and yet it's, it's so it's so wrong. We just, when we're dating, you think about dating life, man, you just long to be with each other. You love to talk, man, you can sit and talk on, you hate talking on the phone, but yet you could talk on the phone for two hours. It's just amazing because we just, we just tend to communicate. And now uh, we just kind of, we don't do that for some reason. And it does, it does harm to our marriage. So first thing, talk, our respect, and these are, I'm going to give you some verses on this. You can jot these down. I should have provided some blanks, but you can just put these down. These are where we get some of these principles. Respect. Jesus said, Matthew 7, verse 12, treat others the way you want to be treated. That's the ultimate verse, I think, on respect, respecting each other. Um, if you, listen, if you wouldn't want it said to you, you wouldn't want somebody to be rude to you, crude to you, cutting, biting, critical, with all, uh, snarky. All, if you wouldn't want that done to you, then you shouldn't do it to someone else. If you wouldn't want it said to you, listen, if you don't want it done to you, silent treatment or uh, acting, uh, you know, going through and acting mad and, and a huff and all, listen, if you don't want any of those things done to you, not withholding service, withhold meeting needs from each other and serving one another, listen, if you wouldn't want that done to you, then we shouldn't do it to un- each other. He's talking about respect. We should have the ultimate respect for our mate, okay? E, enjoy if you want to treasure your love, you need to enjoy each other. Proverbs uh, 5, verse 18, rejoice in the wife of your youth. You remember how you used to enjoy dating? I mean, you did. You looked forward to it, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't have pursued that person. You enjoyed being with them. And we talk, remember we talked about phileo love a minute ago? That's, that's kind of, this is where phileo love would come in. You enjoy doing things together. And I would say it's really, really, yes, you you like your things and she likes her things, but listen, there ought to be times that you really enjoy things together. Look for things, find things, work at things that you really enjoy doing together so you can enjoy one another. Plan that time, protect that time, and utilize that time to enjoy each other. I think it's very, very important to treasure our love that way, okay? A, accept each other. Accept one another. We talked about this last week. We got, we're so different that we need, to, we need to accept each other and our differences. Albert Einstein put it this way. Men marry women with the hope that they will never change. <laughs> women marry men with the hope that they will change. Invariably, they're both disappointed. A lot of truth in that statement. But rather than, you know, and yes, if there's something sinful and something wrong in our personalities, we, we need to work on change. But a lot of times it's issues like um, different tastes. I like this. Well, you like that. I want to go here. I want to go there. And if we're tackling a project, I would do it this way. You would do it this way. And they're not necessarily right or wrong. They're just different. We said last week, listen, God created us male and female. He created us specifically to be different so that we might fit together as one and, and really Uh, come together like that the pieces of the puzzle that we talked about. Colossians 3, verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Look at at what we're supposed to have. Talking about accepting each other. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. And so he tells us how, how we're to accept each other with, you know, understand, hey, no, they're not like me. No, they don't do it like I would do it. Uh, no, they don't think about things the way I think through things. And, and so, but it doesn't make it necessarily wrong. It's that we need to have compassion, kindness, humility, and gentleness, and patience as we uh, interact in those relationships. So I would say, man, that gives us all something to pray about this week. Amen. Hope you'll work through those things. Clayton Tucker marriage counselor, he put it this way, accepting each other. Research, research shows that happy couples are couples that accentuate or focus on their partner's good traits, and his or her negative behavior is seen as rare and unintentional or situational. 
The happy spouse thereby reinforces his or her partner's good traits. In contrast, unhappy couples overlook the positive, emphasize the partner's bad personality traits as the cause of marital problems. So when we look at each other, what he's basically saying is instead of looking at the positives in our mate, we focus on the negative things. And we say, this is the reason why we're having problems. It's because of you and your negative things. He's saying the happy couples, the successful couples, are the ones who, with something negative in my mate, oh, that's just an aberration. That's just a, that's unintentional. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Whatever you want to say, and so I'm going to overlook that, and I'm going to focus on the positive. And man, how encouraging would that be if we could all adopt that philosophy in our marriage? And I think that's what uh, Colossians 3 is telling us to do. Okay, letter S, treasure. S is serve. We are, we are to serve. Listen, agape love is a serving love. Uh, they were, uh, ladies were having a, a women's conference, and, and they were speaking, and the, the ladies speaking to all these women out there. said, so how many of you want to mother your husband? And one little old hand went up in the back. And she said, you want to mother your husband? She said, mother? I thought you said smother. I want to smother the guy. Well, we're, not spo- we're supposed to serve one another. Okay, agape love is a serving love. Now, here, here's the way, I'm going to ask you another probably silly question, but I'm setting you up. I'll just tell you right from the get-go, I'm setting you up. But how many of you want to have a great marriage? I'll be the first to raise my, I want a great marriage. Well, some of you do. Okay, the ones that are still awake still want a, a great marriage. Well, j- the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, how, how can we be, we want to be great, we want, we want to be great. How, how do we do that? Well, here's what Jesus said. Mark 10, verse 43. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. You want to be great? You need to serve your spouse. You want to have a great marriage? You need to serve your spouse. So many times our world, what our world pushes on us is this idea of we're great if others serve us. I've got this many housekeepers, and I've got this many chauffeurs, and I've got, I'm great, and I have all these things. Jesus says, no, the right opposite is true. Those who are great are the ones who serve others. And so that's what we need to do in our marriage. What kind of a servant are you? One to ten, what would you give yourself as a servant to your spouse? Not what you can get, but what can you give? The letter U, understanding. Understand. Um, Proverbs 16, verse 22, understanding is a fountain of life to those who have it. Listen, we ought to seek to understand our mate. We're not going to understand everything. Again, we talked about how God made us different, but we ought to try to understand what they're thinking, understand where they're coming from. So many times we're so busy talking and lecturing that we don't hear where they're coming from. We don't hear their heart. And so that's what Proverbs 16, it's it's just like a fountain of life if you would seek to understand your spouse. We talked about death and life or in the power of the tongue, how we want life in our marriage. Man, your tongue will, will determine a lot of that. And then here, understanding our mate will determine a lot of it as well. So we ought to try to understand. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, I think we go back to the very first one, talk. You've got to communicate. If you're going to understand, listen, not, not lecture, not L for lecture, T for talk, C for communicate. We need to communicate and listen. L wouldn't be lecture, L would be listen. Listen to their heart if you want to understand them. I think that's important. I think prayer is essential. Lord, help me to understand why he's like that. Help me to understand what she means by that. Lord, help me to understand. So prayer is essential. I think study, I think effort, uh, reading books, you know, I mentioned last week Willard Hartley's book, His Needs, Her Needs. Listen, read that book. You'll, you'll have a greater understanding of your wife's mind, your husband's mind. Read that book. Gary Chapman's book, Five Love Languages. There's a lot of good books. I can recommend several of them to you. Do, do you know those things about your spouse? Are, are you just thinking, well, God, just, God's just going to give it to me? No, we have to put forth the effort to understand our mate, our romance. We'll talk about this more later in the series but Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16 says, My lover is mine and I am his. And, 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 and while romance it does talk about that eros love, erotic love, the sexual love, that's true. But there's so much more than that. We said we can't build a marriage on that and we shouldn't. But when you think about romantic love, yes, there's the physical side of it. We'll talk about it later. But what about, listen, you can have a lot of romance as a matter of fact, we, we learned in His Needs, Her Needs, that book, that, that for women, romance is a lot more important than sex. And so that romance, what is, what is romance? Well, it's this idea of, of this person 
is the most important person in, to me. This person is the center of my life. Next to the Lord, this person, I mean, I'm, I'm, this thought of I'm pursuing them. I want to be with them. They're the most, they're so special. They're so important. That's, that's the way romance is. Uh, it, it's just, it's, 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 it's though, man, I have eyes for no one else. I have a heart for no one else. I want you and you alone. And, and you convey that idea to them. That's what romance is, is all about. And so certainly we need to do that. Our, our, listen, our spouse needs to know that next to the Lord Jesus, they're number one. And listen, I'm, think about how you did it when you dated. Are you doing any of those things now? Time together, date nights, gifts, whatever that love language is, service, whatever it is, we need to be doing those things right now. Romance, let them know they're number one. And then finally, the letter E, edify. How do we enhance or advance love? Edify. Ephesians 4 verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only words that are good for edification, that is building up according to the need of the moment that you would give grace to those who hear. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, encourage one another and build each other up. Listen, with our words, there's power of life and death in our words. You're either building your mate up with your words or you're tearing your mate down with your words. That's what's happening. And here's the thing about tearing them down. So many couples, by the time they get to, to us here at church, they don't even know. They don't realize that through the years of their cutting remarks, critical remarks, uh, snarky remarks that what it has done, it's, it, their marriage is dying a slow death. And they don't see it. They don't see it. That's the importance of edification, building each other up, building that person up. You say, how do we do that? Can I I'll just list a few ways? Reinforce positive qualities. Do you ever tell your mate, I mean, I, I just, man, you're, you do this awesome. You're great at this. I just like the way you do this. Just reinforce positive things in their personality and things that they do. Show appreciation. Man, listen, if a simple thing is a meal, thank you for, man, fixing this for me. Thank you for changing my oil in my car. Thank you for mowing the yard or doing my laundry. Just show appreciation, sincere appreciation for things they've done. Don't take them for granted. That's how we build them up. Don't just expect things. So many marriages are just floating along, taking each other for granted. Sincerely compliment one another. Sincerely compliment. And then I think another thing you can do, and, and that is just complete this sentence, and I'd like you to do it this week. I'm talking about building each other up. I love you because, dot, dot, dot. I love you because you do this, because of this characteristic you have, because of this in your personality. I, I just, I love you because. Maybe, hey, listen, maybe do it every day. Could you sit down and think of one thing every day I love you because, maybe once a week, whatever it would be, but sit down with your mate and talk about those things. Okay, so here they are, all things, all the things that damage my love, things that treasure or build my love, and so your homework assignment, I'm out of wish I could get in your home and, and make sure you're doing your assignment, and, but I can't do it. I'm just going to have to trust you to do it, all right? I want you to take that outline, talk through each, take two or three a night or whatever, and just talk. Give myself a grade. One to ten, how am I when it comes to patience or anger in my marriage? How am I on, on, on any of these things? Give yourself a grade. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to your spouse. And, uh, and then pray through those truths. Okay? All right. M love. It's the mortar that holds a marriage together. Father, I thank you for these truths. And Lord, I know as we go through them, we could spend a lot of time on each one. But Lord, I just pray you would seal them to our hearts and that, Lord, we would really contemplate these things. Lord, I don't know where we would say our marriages are on a scale of 1 to 10, but I think every one of us in this room would say it could be better. We could do better. I could do better. And so I just pray that you would take this time in your word and make it profitable as we sit down this week with our spouse to talk about these things. Lead us by your spirit as we do. Lord, we, we give you this invitation. Lord, there may be other decisions here today. Maybe there's someone here who needs to receive the greatest gift that you've given because of your love, the Lord Jesus. And so have your way in our hearts. May we do business with you today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.